Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to St. John's. My name is Steve Clamp. I'm the pastor here, and I, we love that you are here today with us. Um, I was just thinking about I've been the pastor here for not quite three months. It's hard to believe it's already been that long, or that it has, uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you're like, oh my gosh, it's only been three months. <laughs> <laughs> So, anyway, time has flown by for me, and what I like to do as we begin our service is just remind you of two quick things that are, that are happening or that are going on. Uh, first of all, we have our next Advent uh, celebration. Uh, our, our third through eighth graders are going to be doing a program in the, in the gym on the stage at 6 p.m. this, this uh, Wednesday, so we encourage you to join. If you'd like to join us for food... Uh, 515, we'll be having a meal. There's a QR code there. You can sign that up. If you don't know how to use the QR code, that's fine. <laughs> Give us a call in the office. Just tell us how many people uh, in your party will be eating with us. Uh, we just, it just is so helpful for us to figure out just about how many uh, seats and chairs we need to put up and, and just for, for food reasons what we need to supply. So if you'd help us out with that, that would be great. We just had an awesome celebration with the little ones. Um, on Wednesday, and so my second thing is I just want to say thank you <laughs> to all of you for coming and for those of you who helped with it. Um, with the little ones who were doing their performance, we had over 300 people here uh, in the gym on Wednesday, which was uh, amazing um, and hopefully glorifying to God, having those little voices raised up. And I hope you, uh, if you were there, that you enjoyed it. A lot of hard work went into that. So thank you. Uh, big team effort to make that happen. So uh, thank you very much. With that, why don't we begin uh, our opening hymn on uh, safe, comfort, comfort, you might be
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The voice of the prophet cries out to us, Prepare the way of the Lord. The gracious God, whom we know in Christ, comforts us with the promise of grace bigger than every sin. God alone makes us clean and makes us ready to meet Jesus. He comes as a shepherd to carry us in his arms and to lead us home clothed in forgiveness and his very own righteousness. Restore us, O God, and let your face shine on us. That we may be saved. Give ear to your people, O shepherd of Israel. And be your people like a flock. You forgave all the iniquity of your people. You cover up all our sin and show us your steadfast love and faithfulness. Let us confess our sins. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have sinned against you this day. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me, that I may rest in peace. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you. And for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Go up on a high mountain. 
you who bring good tidings to Jerusalem. Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading, our New Testament letter reading, comes from 2 Peter, the third chapter. Peter writes, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by the fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you are able, would you please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel? The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and at this time, I invite you guys, any children who want to come down for a message prepared just for them. Come on down, guys. <clears throat> All right, I got some stuff I want to show you. All right. Good job. Oh, I made it up. I might need nothing back up. I'm going to roll today. Okay. All right. I have a question for you. Do you guys know what Jesus looks like? <laughs> you laugh. Does anyone really know what Jesus looks like? No, actually we don't. We don't have any pictures of Jesus. Now we try to draw pictures, don't we? This, if you look up there on the balcony, you see we have a, a picture of Jesus at the table with his disciples. It's the Last Supper. And in the middle, we have Jesus. We have a picture of Jesus in our, in our uh, stained glass window up there. You see that? And, you know, so I brought some other things of Jesus. This is, oh, look at this one. That's kind of a funny looking one, isn't it? You know, this one, because it's, it's actually inside, no matter where you sit out there, it looks like Jesus is looking at you. That's a little, that's a little freaky. Yeah, um, I have that in my office, and no matter where I go, Jesus is watching. I'm like, wow. 
We've got to remind her. And I have another one. Well, we, we don't know exactly what Jesus looks like. We know what he is like. What are some things that we know that Jesus is like? Do you know? What do you think about, about Jesus? What, what are some things that, when we think about Jesus, we think, is he mean? No. He's nice. Yeah. What are some other things? We, we had in our Old Testament reading, we said something about Jesus being like a... See that picture? What does he have there? He's got a little lamb, right? And he's holding it very close to his heart. We can see that. Jesus is like, it says in the Bible, that he's a shepherd. He tends to us, and we are like his little lambs, and he cares for us, and he loves us. And so what we might not know if Jesus actually looks like that. We know the important thing, that Jesus loves us and cares for us, right? Awesome. Just like the shepherd who guides and keeps us, his sheep. Would you guys pray with me? Let, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus to this earth. And while we don't know what Jesus looks like, we know what he's like. He is full of love and kindness, and he's like a shepherd. Help us to tell others about the good news of Jesus, especially at Christmas when you sent him as a baby in Bethlehem. We pray this all in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you, guys. I have some colored sheets for you. Yeah, you can't take the picture. You can't take that. Oh, you can't take that picture. But here we go. I have, oh, I have some. Yeah, I don't know. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. You know, I think I probably handed you the wrong one, but that's all right. I got two. I'll give you another one. We'll sing our next song. How about that? <laughs>
Actually, that would probably be good for every day. Every day to come before the Lord and to do that. And uh, well, I'm so blessed to be a part of a, of a team here at, at St. John's that uh, gets to do that uh, every day as we walk with children and, and teach them. And so I just wanted to give a, a shout out. As I was thinking about excellent and praiseworthy things, the uh, the, the teachers, the staff at the school and, and the child care center, um, again, are continuing to do just a, an amazing job uh, of fighting through, right now, lots of stomach bug. <laughs> it's kind of running rampant. Um, and my, my mantra to survive is uh, two things. Lots of hand sanitizer and drinking lots of water. Those are my, those are my two things. I haven't got them yet, so uh, praise the Lord. But keep them in prayer and um, you know, just this time of, of Christmas and the excitement with the kids, um, boy, it, there, there's, there's an extra level of energy <laughs> around, the, around the facility during the week, and the teachers are just doing a, a great and amazing job just walking with the students, teaching them, and then teaching them with that love of Jesus and, and always being able to, uh, to bring that back. So can we just praise God for the, for the sacrament? <laughs> God is pouring out His Spirit upon us in, in many and varied ways. And if we just keep our eyes out and keep looking for that, it's amazing what we see. It's amazing to see God uh, compelling us, giving us energy when we don't think we have any more energy to give, or giving us a spirit of joy, even in the midst of the most difficult and challenging situations. And that's what I love about, about our God is that he, he gives us everything that we need and sometimes more than what we were even thinking and strange, unusual, exciting, and uh, different ways that he pours out his spirit. But before you became Christian, or maybe before you understood who God is, or maybe you're still wondering who God is, how did you find him? Or how, did, how, did you, how did you come to this faith? How did you come to this Understand. People ask me that frequently because I tell them I'm a pastor and then we get into all kinds of interesting conversations uh, with that. And, and I, as I've, I've all walked through life and walked alongside people who were not Christian, it's interesting to me where they look for God. I'll ask them if they understand where, where or who my God is or how I understand my faith. And, and, and I'll ask them, like, where, how, how do you find God? Where do you look for Him? And people will, will oftentimes go and say, well, <clears throat> there, there's something about uh, ancient writings that make us think that, that maybe the ancient people had, had a clearer idea of who God was or is. There, there's, a, there's a validity or a, uh, an import that, that has with ancient writings, whether it's ancient Sanskrit, we're, we're looking at the Bhagavad Gita and the, and the Hindu faith. And we're looking at uh, Buddhism, all right? We, we, can, we can find some ancient writings. Uh, Islam, they're not as ancient as, as some. Uh, take a look at the Hebrew Bible. And people stack up these, these ancient scriptures and they'll say, which, which ones are right? There's something about things that are old that seem to have an element of truth to them. And so some people look for ancient writings and some people look for the more bizarre ancient writings, uh, as opposed to the more common ones. Some people look for uh, God in secret societies. They think that maybe there's, there's a group of people who have, who have keys to knowledge that, that we don't have yet. And, and so you, you go and you try to find within a, a, a small group of people who have the inside scoop on who God is. And yet others look to intellectual, the intellectual community, the the, the scientists, the, the experts. <clears throat> and I was always people say, well, experts say, I'm like, who are these? Like, how do I, how do I get the title of pastor speak expert? You know, like, can I, can, I, can I be considered an expert on something? And, you know, <clears throat> I, I can be an expert on uh, flip-flops. That's, that's <laughs> like, you know, if you need anything, okay? I'm an expert on that. If you need any knowledge on that, I will, I will take that. Expert flip-flop. I'm a flip-flop kind of sort. Um, <clears throat> But intellectual communities go, go to what they can perceive or think. And how do we go that way? 
I was a philosophy minor in, in undergrad, and so I, I got to study all the, the great philosophers and, and to see how the, their intellect tried to comprehend God. And depending on whether or not you were starting from a standpoint of there is a God, you would not be able to prove there is, is a, if, if there is a God, you could not disprove that God exists. And if you started from the point where there was no God, you could not prove from intellect that there is a God. And so there's always the, the big philosophical conundrum, where do we start? Do we start assuming there is a God or assuming there is no God? And depending on where you start, that will actually, if you're just doing your intellect, that is also where you will head. So the intellectual community doesn't necessarily get us any further. But more so than, than where we look, I, I think oftentimes that, that that's actually directed by what kind of a God we're looking for. Right? And, 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 and usually what I, what I see is, is people like a, a controllable God, um, maybe transactional. A God, if, if, if I do this, then you do that for me. right? Uh, we do this all the time. And in fact, uh, almost all world religions have some component of this. I have to do something to get a benefit, and there's a, there's a transaction. I can somehow control God. I can do that. We want a God who's available 24-7. Uh, and we, got, we want a God who's powerful. We want a God who, 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 can, who can do the things that we can't do. But, but the available and powerful are only if we can control them, right? That, that's really the, the, the ideal God, would be a God who would just do whatever I told him to do. <laughs> And, and have the power to do that and be available 24-7. We want a God who, who will do for us what we want, when we want, and how we want. That's just in our selfish nature. And so when we come to religion, when we come to these things, and we find out that in the ancient writings, some of the ancient writings will have gods who will be controllable, who are who are compliant to a certain degree, but almost always there's, there's an element of unwanted power or control that, that gets us. Whether or not you, if you misbehave, then there's that powerful God who will judge and condemn. If you don't do it exactly right, things will go wrong, or maybe you get sort of what you want, but then there's, a, there's always a hook, there's always a, a payment and a penalty. And people have searched high and wide, long and far, to find the truth about God. All the time with that selfish understanding of, I want to define. <laughs> I want a God that I can, I can define, that I can make. And some people, after they have looked through all of the, the various ancient writings, they'll come to the conclusion that there is no God. Or at least there's no God that we can know. They're either agnostic, uh, fancy word for not able to know. All right, so gnosis is the is the Greek word for knowledge, um, and whenever you put an A in front of it in Greek, that means it's a negative sign. So it's we don't have any knowledge about God. We can't know about God, so we're agnostic. Maybe there's a God, but we don't know about. A theist would be someone who says there is no God, <laughs> that, that God does not exist, and so we and, and so why even even bother. Well, I, I believe there are people who are agnostic. I, I don't believe anybody can technically be atheist. Because there's always a God. There, there's always something that we believe in. There's always something that we put our, our faith, our trust, our confidence in. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's our bank account. Maybe it's our, our job, our influence. Maybe it's our, our family, our friends, a spouse. We, we put these people or things on a pedestal, and they become the center of our life. But if we really want to get to know God, the first thing we have to understand is that we don't get to define God. We, we, as soon as we start to define God, if we, if we out of our own mind, create God, we, we've already lost. We, we've missed. Because we're going to create a God in our image. And then many people criticize religion in general and say, oh, that's just a human invention. And I say, well, you know what? I think a lot of religions are. But when it comes to Christianity, when we say this, we don't get to define God. 
we have to have God reveal himself to us. When, when we do that, it gets scary. Because guess what? We have to give up control. But we don't, we don't get to put God in a box. Granted, he puts himself in a manger, which is part of a box. But he did that, not us. He must reveal himself to us. And look what, look what Paul says in, the, in, in, in Romans chapter 1. Paul says this. He goes, what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. And he's talking about people who are, who are uh, living a life in, in complete disobedience to God. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. According to Paul, he says, we all should know there is a God. <laughs> that, that there is no excuse. That, that people who, who even say egg, they're agnostic, that they say there's no knowledge about God, Paul says, wrong. <laughs> there's no excuse. Take a look at the world around you. Take a look at the creation. Creation itself reveals that God has eternal power and has a divine nature. Recent uh, scholarly uh, investigation, I would say, of, of the origin of all things. There, there's, there's a couple of different philosophies out there in, in regard to how all things came into existence. Is there a big bang and then, and then a, you know, a long series of evolution? There's an intelligent design science that's coming out saying, you know, when you take a look at creation, when you really look at cellular structures, we can't get to a point where we can reduce a cell into more, even more basic parts. Eventually, you break it down and the cell fails. So you can't start from a simple cell and get more complex. They said, because the, so the simplest cell is already a lot. That you can't build into a simple cell. It's, the, the fancy word is irreducibly complex. Even the most simple cell, a single cell, the amoeba, is already so complex that it can't be put together like Legos. <laughs> the pieces, it just is or it isn't. And, and there's no way to get there. And we have no idea how life can be created. We still haven't figured that out. Anyone who wants to talk to you about a big bang and, and, and the start of life, you ask, well, how did that start? How did we get there? How did we get from inorganic things to organic things? From things that are not alive to things that are alive? An intellectual scientific community cannot give you an answer. They don't know. We haven't figured that out yet, they'll tell you. We're still working on it. I tell you, I know. Paul says, creation itself is the clue that there is a God who has eternal power and has a divine nature. God has revealed himself in his creation that he has this power to create life. We can't do it, but he can. And that's amazing and that's awesome and that's not something that humans like to give up. Power, control, but God has it. He has a divine nature. So creation reveals that God has these things. And we read in Isaiah, God himself reveals to Isaiah this thing. He says, see, the sovereign Lord comes with power. His arm rules for him. And see, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. God reveals to Isaiah that not only does he have divine power, yes, he's still got that power, but he does it to rule, and he has a reward. With them. Or payment, recompense, it just means not, uh, oh, I said all that wrong, uh, recompense. <laughs> Got an extra P in there. Uh, yeah. uh, recompense, it, it just means a payment for, for work done uh, in some regards. Uh, it, it's just a, a, mostly a synonym for reward. But notice that God's power is here to rule, to be in charge. He's not controlled. We, we don't get to control God. He's the one who's in charge. He's sovereign. He reigns over all things. And this is where it really starts to get uncomfortable. Let's understand our God. And he's got all that power, and, and he's going to rule, 
then all of a sudden that means I'm subject. I'm, I'm subject to God. I'm, I am his subject. I am underneath him, and that makes me uncomfortable. Should make you uncomfortable as well. Because I'm not sure sometimes the things that I've done should, should result in reward or penalty or punishment. But it says in the, in the next verse, though, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms and he keeps them, carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Maybe you want to stop at, at, at the God that rules is, is angry, perhaps, is sovereign. He's going to punish. He's got that arm to rule, absolutely, 100%. But if you stop there, you miss. You miss the, the amazing part here that God has revealed to Isaiah. His love, his compassion is what tempers things. He, he shepherds. He uses his kingship, but he shepherds. He, he rules, but he also tenderly cares. He keeps people close. He has a reward, a recompense. He, he can punish, <coughs> but he also gently leads. And these things seem conflicting. They, to, to have an all-powerful, almighty God, and yet one who, who tenderly cares, who wants to be close to his people. Second Peter reminds us that he wants all people to be saved, to come to repentance and come to salvation. And while our God is not controllable, he's good God. I love the uh, uh, C.S. Lewis and, and his various different writings. And as I was thinking about all of these things, uh, uh, a passage from, from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that uh, popped up in, in, my, in my mind, where C.S. Lewis is, he writes a, a, an amazing story that, that parallels, I think, Scripture and, and Jesus death and resurrection and salvation. Just writes it in a maybe more fantastical way. But there's a lot of deep truths in there. A lot of deep scriptural truths. And here's, here's a passage for you. As uh, Susan is talking to, to Mr. Beaver. And Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion. The lion. The great lion. Ooh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. <laughs> what, what an amazing description. Aslan is the lion. Jesus, the lion of Judah. That's not a, a coincidence that Jesus has taken that and C.S. Lewis takes it to talk about our, our God, if you're looking for a safe God, if you're looking for a comfortable God, you know what? Christianity is probably not for you. Because our God isn't safe. He challenges us to do things, to step outside of our comfort zone, to, to, to go into places that, that really make us uncomfortable, and that's not safe. He challenges us to look at ourselves. It's not safe to look into our own hearts and see the failures that we have. And understanding that if I really want to understand who God is in his love, his compassion, his power, I may have to change the way I live my life. I may have to change my perspective. That's not safe. God wants me to change. God constantly wants me to become better, more like him every day. But he's good. But he's a good guy. He's just. He's holy, he's righteous, and he loves like a shepherd. He tenderly cares and wants to gather you and me close in his arms. That's what we get to do here in a little bit when we come for, for the Lord's Supper. We have the very body and blood of Jesus Christ here with us, and he, he gathers us together. I don't know if you've ever thought about that in communion. It's, a, it's sort of like Jesus coming and, and wrapping his arms around us as a family and saying, here, I want to draw you close to me. I love you and I care for you. Here. Here is your God. Here is your God. Now, maybe the, the one you've been looking for, maybe he's not exactly the one that you want. Because he's not controllable. He's not safe. But he's always available. And he is good. He's not our maker. 
He's not no farming. And praise God for that. Because if God were flexible, compliant, and pliable to, to what I would want, this world would be in, in a much, much worse condition. We talk about people who say religion is of human invention. I tell you what, no one could invent, no human mind could invent this bizarre of a God. A God who creates all things, who gives free will to his people. When they mess up, he takes the punishment. Who does that? Our God does. He's a shepherd ruler. He rules as a king, but also as a leader, guider, director, one who loves and cares for the sheep, who gathers them together. He has great and amazing power to give us everything that we need, not everything we want, but everything we need with love. That great and amazing power <coughs> tempered through his love for all people to be saved. While I have my ideas about what God should and shouldn't do, uh, usually benefits me greatly, um, I am thankful that I have a God who cares for me enough to say no sometimes, but cares for me enough to send his son, to send his son to die for me. I need that more than anything else. That that salvation is yours as well. When we come before the Lord and say, here, yes, here is our God. Here is our loving, caring, compassionate God that we praise and glorify because he's not safe, but he is good. And he is good to all eternity because he brings salvation as a reward. Not, not that we've earned it. We have earned this, but he brings it to give to us because he loves and cares for us. This is our God. This is the God we praise and worship. And this is the God we confess in a little bit with the Nicene Creed. Now, may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in this God, this awesome and amazing, powerful, yet loving shepherd God for you and me now and forever. Amen. Let us confess this God, as I said, as we stand and use these ancient words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all.
Lord, help us to continue to evaluate our lives, to, re to willingly come before you, confess our errors, and trust in your forgiveness. That we might be ready to receive the very body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, this day, as we come before you with humble hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord God, we lift up before you all those who are sick, who, who need healing. We lift up before you Linda, Lord, recovering from a brain bleed. From Todd, who had a heart procedure. Uh, for Mark, and for Lyle, and for Sharon, Lord, continue to be a presence in their lives, Lord. That, that your spirit might be there, giving them courage. And may your healing hand come upon those, Lord, according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord God, we lift up before you our, our school, our, our child care, the whole staff, and, and all of our students and the children here. We ask that your loving and protecting hand would be over them, especially as Lord, we just have had a rash of illnesses. May, may we continue to look to you, Lord, for, for healing, for strength. And when we are sick, when we return to health, may we be able, like that one leper, turn back to you, Lord, and give you thanks and praise for all your blessings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, all of these things and even more we put into your hands, for we trust in your mercy, for you've shown it to us very clearly in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, when he was here on earth, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
that out of your power and your might, you have refreshed us with this salutary gift, the gift of your Son's very body and blood today. May it strengthen and encourage us, Lord, that we might live in, in cheerful service to you, and that in all that we say and do, we can give you praise and honor and glory. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.